Now coming to minimal change disease, which is the commonest cause of uh, primary nephrotic syndrome. Uh, it is more common in children, it around 70% of them will have and there will be a preceding history of uh, upper respiratory tract infection or known allergies or immunizations. And this usually presents with generalized edema or anasarca. The blood pressure will be essentially normal, renal function tests also will be normal. Urine will have a massive proteinuria which is called as nephrotic range of proteinuria more than 3.5 grams uh, per meter body surface area. Now, in this a particular primary nephrotic syndrome, you will have light microscopy and immunofluorescence which is essentially normal, LM and IF, I am going to use these two abbreviations and EM stands for electron microscopy. Under electron microscopy, you are going to see a generalized food process fusion which we call it as loss of food processes and this disease responds very well to steroids and the prognosis is excellent. Coming to the next entity, membranous glomerulonephritis, it's common primary nephrotic syndrome in adults, around 40% of them and the causes for this could be idiopathic, there is no known cause, hepatitis, malaria, syphilis, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, mixed connective tissue disorders, usage of gold, penicillamine and certain neoplasms. Again, these patients will have, of course, the age of onset, it's in adults, more common, a presence of anasarca or generalized edema, but there will be hypertension, renal failure, and the urine will show non-selective nephrotic range of proteinuria and hematuria. The light microscopy here will show a thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, and spikes will be seen there, it's called dense deposits at times, and immunofluorescence will always reveal a granular immunoglobulin deposition and C3, the complement number 3. And electron microscopy shows sub-epithelial deposits. In these patients, renal vein thrombosis is a common complication and definitely steroid will slow down the progression of this illness to renal failure. Coming to the next entity called as FSGS, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, where there is a segmental involvement of the nephrons. This accounts to around 10 to 15 percent of all the primary nephrotic syndromes in both children and in adults. And the etiology are again a no known cause or idiopathic and systemic illnesses like diabetes mellitus, HIV, retroviral disease, heroin abuse at times and this also presents with generalized edema. And hypertension is common here and urine again shows a non-selective range of uh, proteinuria. Hematuria could be present and light microscopy reveals a segmental loss of the glomeruli because of the sclerosis and there will be zixta and especially the zixta medullary glomeruli, the glomeruli opposite the medulla. And the immunofluorescence studies here show IgM and complement 3 and these are specifically present wherever there is glomerulosclerosis which could be patchy as in here. An electron microscopy shows a massive sub-endothelial deposits of proteins. Now, listed in these conditions is membrane no proliferative. Here you see there is more of disease progression or a more involvement of glomeruli, so this is more serious time. And this accounts for 10% of primary nephrotic syndrome in adults and also in children. And they are classified basically as type 1 and type 2. Type 1, the etiology is again infections. Most of them are preventable or treatable, so it's very important. And the listed infections are hepatitis B, at times hepatitis C, HIV and infective endocarditis of any etiology. And non-infectious like systemic lupus erythematosus, cryoglobulinemia and certain neoplasms. And type 2 etiology is slightly different. Here the patients present with a generalized edema, hematuria, oliguria and hypertension is common here and urine will have a non-selective proteinuria and hematuria. And again you see there is a hypocomplementinemia here especially of complement number 3. And coming to the histopathology of the kidney, the renal biopsy is the key in all these etiologies of nephrotic syndrome that you have to remember. So let's move on. The glomeruli here are hypercellular and glomerular basement membrane is thickened. 
uniform will thicken. And type 1 will have the immunofluorescence showing Ig, immunoglobin and classic pathway complements. And they are distributed along the periphery of the glomerular lobules. So this is the specificity which you will elicit if any performer microscopy with immunofluorescence. And electron microscopy will reveal subendothelial deposits. In type 2, again, immunofluorescence shows an alternative pathway of complementary deposition in the mesangium, particularly. And electron microscopy shows an intramembranous dense deposit, which is quite massive. And so that's that's what makes this disease more diffuse. And membrane of proliferative glomerulonephritis is naturally the prognosis is poor. Now coming to mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis, this accounts again for around 5% to 10% of all the primary nephrotic syndromes. And here the light microscopy reveals glomerular cellularity, proliferation of the mesangial and the endothelial cells and infiltration by monocytes. Earlier you did not see this kind of a monocyte infiltration in the other situations. And this, that's why there is an increase in the overall cellularity in the glomeruli. And this definitely hampers the function of the glomerular basement membrane. And the immunofluorescence is the deposition of IgA, IgG, IgM and or sometimes complements. Coming to the differential diagnosis, usually for nephrotic syndrome, the first differential diagnosis which we come across will be congestive cardiac failure. But here there will be a elevated JVP which is classical for right heart failure. And of course no facial puffiness or periorbital swelling will be there. Proteinuria will be less severe in these patients. Now coming to the liver disease. In cirrhosis and portal hypertension, again, you come across edema, but you have telltale evidence and stigma of cirrhosis, which we learned in the last flip class session. And the edema is predominantly prevalent in the legs, that's a pedal edema, and abdomen due to ascites. And other causes of hypoalbumin, like protein energy malnutrition, which is coming down in many parts of the world now, and protein losing enteropathies. Let's come to the investigations which will clinch the diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome. The 24 hours urinary protein is very essential for nephrotic syndrome diagnosis wherein you should get 3.5 grams of protein in 24 hours in an adult patient and serum albumin should be less than 30 gram per liter or 3 gram per deciliter. Other investigations should be fasting lipid profile where the cholesterol will be high, LDL will be high. HD will be normal and triglycerides will definitely be elevated in more than 50% of the patients. So this is a, another important criteria for nephrotic syndrome. And the renal functions will be essentially normal to begin with when the disease has not progressed. And even the creatinine clearance which is more specific will be normal. And this is in the beginning before the disease has progressed as I said. In, in all nephrotic syndromes, it's not just enough to fulfill the criteria by doing those four investigations I have mentioned, but you always have to go looking for the etiology or the underlying cause. So you look for all other conditions, you look for the urine microscopy for the cast, the RBC cast will clinch a diagnosis for you of a proliferative glomerulonephritis. And throat swab and ESO titus have to be taken for the streptococcal infection. Serum complement levels have to be done because of this immune complex mediated glomerulonephritis where usage of complements occurs and there will be an end result of hypocomplementinemia. Fasting sugars, postprandials of course have to be done for diabetes mellitus. And we continue with the further investigations. Antinuclear antibodies, DSDNA for SLV, ANCA for systemic vasculitis, anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody for good pastures. These have to be done and screening for hep B, hep C, syphilis and malaria you have to be looking for in rarer instances and renal biopsy will clinch the diagnosis after you prepare the patient for renal biopsy and once the patient has no contraindications for renal biopsy we will go ahead with renal biopsy to see whether this diagnosis is in other than MCD I mean to say if there is a minimal change disease you do not have to do a renal biopsy in your clinical diagnosis and by response to steroid also we know that it is minimal change disease. And here is shown a very uh, pictorial depiction in the black and white. You can see all the layers microscopically 
the minimal change disease is shown here. And you could see how when the acute glomerular nephritis sets in, all the sub epithelial depositions can happen and membranous what can happen. So I'm sorry if this picture is a very small print, but it's a very complete picture of all different histopathological manifestations represented in one glomerular apparatus.